All right. All right, so I think we'll get started. I do want to thank uh, Brian today. He's coming from, he's our New York State IPM um, person. He's based out of Rochester. So I do want to thank Brian for doing this Master Gardener in-service today on Gypsy Moss. We had a lot of calls last year on the Master Gardener helpline. And the suggestion was that we um, have a, it, MG in-service training so that we have a better idea of what we can share with um, local consumers when they do call us. We are expecting probably again this year some higher gypsy moth numbers. So Brian, I am going to turn it over to you. Great. I'm going to share my screen and start the presentation. All right. Now, can you see the big screen there? Yes, you're good. No, a little box is okay. All right. So yeah, thanks, Janice. As you said, there have there was a lot of uh, gypsy moths last year, and because of that, there are a lot of egg masses, and we're anticipating um, kind of a, another outbreak year. Uh, the good news is, you know, they generally last only for two to four years in most cases, but it can kind of be bad during those times. And so we wanna be ready uh, with information for consumers um, and for ourselves for our own backyard. And here's just some images of gypsy moths. We'll take a look at all of those as we go on. But here's the caterpillar, kind of a colorful critter there, isn't it, with the blue and red uh, dots on it. And uh, you can see what it's doing here. It's chewing the leaves. They eat voraciously, they grow very quickly. Um, in a matter of days, they gain a lot of size from tiny little insects that come out and start chewing on leaves to these larger ones that finish up and then become a moth. But uh, they're a chewing insect that uh, eats away on leaves and we'll talk about which kind of trees they feed on. They, they, it's quite a few different types, but uh, here's why we really care because they can take all the leaves off of the off of trees. And uh, they do stop feeding, you know, later in June. And many trees can handle that stress, put out additional foliage. But uh, it is definitely a stress. It uses the tree's reserves. And um, if there's a drought, if this happens two or three years in a row, then the trees uh, may die. And this is why we're concerned. The U.S. Um, Forest Service has looked at this uh, and uh, they're uh, with this northeastern, um, oops, let me go back here with this map here, you can see they have highlighted some areas where they anticipate it to be an issue. I uh, put an arrow there, Genesee County, just so, uh, just for a frame of reference, but you can pick out your own point there in New York State. Um, they really, uh, highlighted the green areas here where there's a lot of oak and that they could anticipate oak mortality from repeated defoliation. So uh, just areas of concern. And there are spots here um, where oaks occur and we can be concerned about it, but it's not just the forested oaks, of course, it's an annoyance in our yard, in our landscape and in our woodlot. So, um, it is something we all need to pay attention to. I took these pictures last year in June when my wife and I were camping in uh, the Finger Lakes area, so south of Rochester and uh, in the, the Bristol Hills area. And here you can see the different stages. This was actually another picture I put in. This is where uh, they're at right now in this egg mass. We're gonna take a closer look at those but they were feeding, some of them were already starting to form this crystallis. It's like a cocoon, but instead of coming out as a nice butterfly, of course, they come out as a moth and lay eggs again. Uh, they mate and lay eggs. And um, it was on oak trees there. And on our tent, it sounded like rain with the droppings coming down. And um, here you can see, they also were feeding on pine. But uh, this was actually in a, 
about March of last year in another area of the Finger Lakes. So um, there were some egg mass masses out there and uh, just more shots. So the female lays the eggs and that's kind of the last thing she does. She often dies right there above the egg mass and then just weathers off. A Christmas tree grower sent me these. He had his keys there just for size. This is a, a large tree next to his grove. And there you can see um, the egg mass there, <clears throat> kind of an unusual spot, kind of in amongst the branches. Normally we see them on the trunk, but they can lay them on anything. They could lay them on uh, stacked wood that's in your yard that might be burnt. This is why we don't want to move firewood. They could do it on lawn furniture, on your car, anything. And so I want to take a look for those egg masses. And this is this year. I was in uh, Springwater, uh, New York, in Livingston County and took these pictures. So um, this was, I guess it was February, later in February, and um, there's snow on the ground. But can you see? all of these uh, egg masses here. These are really large oak trees and they're just covered with these egg masses. And I put some arrows here um, so you can see all of them that were there. And so with you know 50 or 100 eggs in each of those egg masses, sometimes even more, uh, you can imagine the number of little caterpillars that are gonna be coming out and their time to hatch um, based on the weather, and that would be at the time when the leaves are coming out. So uh, they don't come out before there's a food source for them, and that is the oak tree leaves. And that's, you know, these were really large trees. That was a close-up view there, but uh, it would be very hard to scrape these. If you see any that are, you know, within reach and you can scrape them, that's going to help that tree. Some of these, though, are so far up, it would be very difficult. You can never imagine climbing those trees to uh, scrape those, could you? Look at this. <laughs> 1922 in Massachusetts, when gypsy moths were first introduced there, they're still spreading, by the way. Uh, they just reached uh, Michigan in the 1980s and are still spreading west and south. But um, there it was, Massachusetts, in 1922, and they were um, removing these by hand, scraping them off of the important trees that were there in the landscape. Um, yeah, not happening now. There are some community-wide sprays that happen in some municipalities when it is severe enough in some states more than others. But again, we have uh, these egg masses that are out there. There's the female gypsy moth, and she doesn't feed. Uh, that adult uh, is only out really for a short period of time. She mates with a, a male and then lays that egg mass there. And it's felt like it's a little bit furry and you can break it apart. Got another picture of that a little bit later on. And there are these little tiny BB-like eggs that are in there. there and they're all, they are almost uh, like metallic looking, kind of a golden bronze color. Um, and <clears throat> if you're scraping those, you want to maybe put a Ziploc bag up to the edge and uh, scrape those in and then put some rubbing alcohol or something in there. If you do bring them inside at this time of year, they will hatch. They just need the warm conditions and uh, you could have pet gypsy moths. <laughs> I've done it in an experiment and they'll just, they'll eat just about any kind of leaf that, uh, you get them, you get them, um, but um, yeah, we don't wanna encourage that. We do wanna destroy them. But I have to tell you um, that these egg masses look somewhat similar to the egg masses of spotted lanternfly. And that's an insect that only is in a few locations in New York, but we wanna keep an eye out for it. It was just found in the Ithaca area um, as egg masses and uh, there's a eradication effort underway. So this is what spotted lanternfly egg masses look like. And again, like the, the female gypsy moth, the spotted lanternfly uh, lays her eggs there and is, is right above them. She will move around and lay more than one egg mass. And they also feed as adults. 
unlike the gypsy moths that are just out uh, laying their eggs. And here you can see the individual uh, spotted lanternfly eggs um, and the eggs that are covered by this mud-like substance. So there is a little bit of difference, but you can see the similarity, especially at a distance. If you're looking up to these, they might be confused for gypsy moth eggs. So we want really you to take a, a close look for these. Uh, an alert, a student actually found these uh, spotted litter, lanternfly egg masses just uh, back in November uh, in Ithaca. And this is why we care about them because they feed on grapevines. And the image on the right is a vineyard in Pennsylvania that was actually killed by a uh, spotted lanternfly. They fed heavily there in the fall, and then the leaves didn't come back on in the following spring. The vines were dead. And so, you know, Pennsylvania has a little bit of a grape industry and wine industry. But of course, New York, it's very important for us in several regions of the state, including the Finger Lakes, uh, the extensive uh, grape juice growing area near Lake Erie, and then Long Island and Hudson Valley, and even up uh, in the Adirondacks in a couple of areas. So, um, vineyard managers, and we all should really be on the lookout for these spotted lanternflies. We're likely mostly to notice the adult phases of these, and they, when they show their underwings, they're brightly colored underwings, and um, they are polka dotted, so they're very distinct. They're not confused easily for very many other insects. Uh, and I'm working on a program to make everybody aware, and that's why I'm talking about it today, even though our main topic is gypsy moths. We want to be able to identify the spotted lanternflies and if um, and be on the lookout for both these adults and these egg masses. As I mentioned, this is what was found in November, and that added another spot to our map. These are the only locations where um, the spotted lanternfly has been reported so um, we have this new area right here in Tompkins County and um, New York State Ag and Markets and DEC. Uh, and we are working all together to help uh, potentially eradicate that, uh, that location there because it's like expanding naturally in this area. It is in the New York City area now. It's in Orange County, uh, downstate and Rockland as well. But uh, this is an outlier, and hopefully that'll be eradicated. But this is what you might see. So be on the lookout for this, uh, because it could pop up anywhere, as it did in Ithaca. These are This is a photo that I took in Pennsylvania, and uh, pretty distinct. That was on a maple tree. We're likely mostly uh, to find them on Alanthus trees at first, but uh, they will feed on a variety of different trees. And here they are in the bark. You know, you would think uh, a polka dotted insect like this is going to be easy to see, but at a distance, it can be camouflaged. Here are uh, the adult spotted lanternflies on uh, another maple tree right there. So as I wrap up the spotted lanternfly with this uh, last slide about them, just want to remind you that if you see them, see anything that you think might be a spotted lanternfly, we really want you to report it, um, even if you're not sure. You know, you can bring it to uh, the extension office, but just really uh, note your location, take a lot of pictures, um, and then um, <clears throat> we want uh, the reports eventually to go in through this. If you go on to the New York State IPM Spider Lanternfly website, if you put in New York State Spider Lanternfly map, this is the web page that'll come up. It's the uh, only map that's tracking the spread that's out there right now. And uh, there's a link here for a public report. And you put in your um, information right here. It walks you through. It's really easy. You can upload um, pictures and uh, that goes in. You'll get a response back right away from that. So that's just what we'd ask you to do. Any questions about spotted lanternfly before I get back to gypsy moth? I don't see any, um, Brian. We did have one question about 
are there any other look-alike caterpillars of the gypsy moth? Oh yeah, yeah. You know that that's a good question. The eastern tent caterpillar can look somewhat like it, but it doesn't have those red and blue spots. It's more of a dark green and brown. And like the name implies, they, they do have uh, tents that they go to, uh, which are you know these webbings that are in the branch crotches that show up. So the eastern tin caterpillar could look somewhat like the gypsy moth, but um, if they're crawling up and down um, and not located with uh, a tent, and you, it's hard to miss the tent for the eastern tent caterpillars. Likely, you're seeing gypsy moths. And here's just some more images. They can show up on spruce. We normally think of them on oaks and other broadleaf trees, but we're seeing them on evergreens these days. And here's uh, a few shots from uh, Michigan. And I like this picture because it shows the defoliation at the top. And I've seen this too, and I think I have some pictures somewhere of this, but I, I like using theirs where you might think, yeah, what's wrong with that tree? And it does often occur at the top. And you might not know that there are caterpillars that are actually feeding, causing that browning. So if you start to see even a little bit of that, get in there and take a look, especially early on, because that's when the control is the most effective, when those caterpillars are really small. And we'll talk about what you can use a little bit later. But um, yeah, um, if you see a little bit of that browning, take a close look in there. And here are the egg masses. If you catch it early with the egg masses, that is good. You can remove some of them and then you can be ready to spray just as those um, egg masses hatch. Uh, and here it is. I do a lot of work with Christmas tree growers across New York State. And uh, we occasionally have an outbreak in blue spruce and Douglas fir tree. A lot of the other Christmas trees that are grown like Fraser fir are not susceptible but uh, they do like blue spruce and Douglas fir. Uh, here is one, they were just accumulating on a trunk. They didn't get very far climbing up that trunk because uh, of course there's nothing there for them to eat, but uh, it can end up like this. This one grower south of Rochester had lost, um, you know, maybe a quarter acre of trees due to uh, a, a gypsy moth feeding. That was the only cause of this. They just uh, were defoliated so completely. There's a little bit of a dry um, year and those trees were dead. And they're, they're younger, so they didn't have a lot of reserves to go from. Um, so that was July in November in the surrounding trees. We scouted, we found a bunch of these. And sometimes you have to look closely to get in there you know, put your head inside the tree, look at the trunk, and there you can see the egg masses. And again, if it's a small operation and you can scrape those off, uh, getting them out of there, that's the best thing you can do. But just knowing that they're there and that some will be missed, most likely, uh, just being ready to spray in about mid-May when they first start to hatch, that's gonna be your best way to control. Uh, and some trees, you might want to use a, um, a oil to smother them if you can't reach them. We'll talk about we'll talk about that in a little bit. Here's one where I scraped it off, and I just wanted uh, this image so I could show people what it looks like. So it it's that mass there, right? And it is felt like so it's kind of soft. There's a bunch of little hairs. It feels like there that are very soft. And we're looking at the underside in my hand right here. And then just uh, putting it between my fingers, we can see those individual uh, eggs there. So that's one tiny egg, smaller than the head of a pin, that will be hatching. And that caterpillar will be really tiny, but it doesn't stay that way uh, very long. In a matter of days, as it's eating, it grows and grows and grows. So there you can see all of those eggs you know, some of these still have the fur around them inside those egg masses. Is anybody on um, the uh, program today 
seen any egg masses? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Janice. <laughs> yeah, I had somebody bring in photos of um, from the Stafford area, and I think she also had photos from Pembroke. So we have seen them in the area, and we actually had photos sent on of egg masses last fall. Good. So for identification. So, yeah. Yeah, we've been seeing them in certain areas, certain areas. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. It's real spotty. Like here in Rochester, I have not seen any, but you travel just down a little south of here to Ontario County, you see a, a lot right now. And that's the way it is. It will show up. We'll have these outbreaks. And then, you know, in time, they go down. We'll talk about that again. Just the gypsy moths. There's the caterpillars. Uh, this was June out at that Christmas tree farm where we knew they had an issue. They did treat, but they missed some trees. And these are getting a little bit bigger now. These are three quarters. They're an inch. A little more difficult to control uh, at this stage. But um, they're already uh, defoliating those young trees there. And then, you know, I showed that picture where they were killed and then the egg masses to scout. So it's really a year long thing, on, even though they're really only um, a nuisance and out and active for a few months. Most of the time they're in these egg masses. Uh, we can look for them year round. And um, as Janice mentioned, she was hearing in the fall about the egg masses. They're still out there right now as egg masses. So uh, something to keep an eye on and we talked about the outbreaks and they will and we're in one of those outbreak times in western new york right now but there is good news and that is there is natural control and this first there's two types of this natural control that occur and this first one is a virus disease and this occurs when the population really builds up high that's when we see the colony or the caterpillars around really collapse and then we might go several years eight or ten years without seeing a gypsy moth because this virus is out there keeping the populations low so um when this is there you'll see these dead deflated caterpillars and they typically uh, die in a v shape of some sort or another and they cling to the tree and that actually helps disperse the virus around uh, when they do that. And it's kind of known as a knee, an NPV virus. Um, and it is effective when the populations are high. That's when it can really cause the population to collapse. And um, the weather um, can affect these natural controls, particularly this one. So this is the other one that's out there. And the weather plays an important factor in this. And I think the reason, one of the reasons that our populations are so high is we had a relatively dry May and June last year. And that um, prevented this disease of the caterpillars from really being effective. So this is a fungus disease. The last one was a virus. This is a fungus and weather does play a really important role. Like any fungi, it likes humidity to grow for its spores to be distributed. And um, we didn't have that last year. Hopefully we'll have, you know, we don't like a lot of rain. We like our good weather, but when we do have it, it really helps uh, keep the uh, gypsy moths, just gypsy moth caterpillars under control. And there are, there's another natural control that we can use, and that is BT, Bacillus thiangentis. This is a stomach poison. It's a, a bacteria that does not affect us, but it really affects uh, gypsy moths and other caterpillars and some other uh, garden caterpillars that may occur in your vegetable garden. They can be controlled effectively with this, um, you know, the scientists have formulated it, companies are now offering it, and they have really for 20 years or so. So it's out there, it's tried and true. The only thing, the only limitation for this is you need to apply it when the caterpillars are small. 
when they're small and you have it on the foliage, it is highly effective. And the great thing about it is it's not going to harm other insects. It's not going to harm, um, you know, the beneficial insects that are out there. It's not going to harm you or I. We can't become infected with Bacillus thuringiensis. So um, really the recommended control. Just want to know that you're, you have it out there. If you've seen egg masses and you've removed some, but you know, you're know you not sure whether you got them all, uh, you're going to want to look for those tiny caterpillars and, and treat with this if you can early on. Um, yeah, and I will mention that um, commercial growers also are using the same product. Those uh, acres and acres of Christmas trees are also using a BT type product to catch it early because they don't want to kill all the other beneficial insects that are out there because then they can have outbreaks of other insects like spider mites and that kind of thing. Um, so, so Brian, I, had, I have a question on the BT. Yes. Um, I know in so like if you're a homeowner and you have an oak tree i know oak trees ah. support actually a lot of other lepidoptera species i'm assuming this would also kill them but is the timing such that maybe those aren't out i don't know it seems like in may a lot of things are coming out good question um, yeah we like those other caterpillars that feed on the oak trees they're actually important for food sources for birds. Um, and some birds will eat a few gypsy moth caterpillars and so will some mice will eat the eggs, but they're not an important food source because they're not a native pest. Gypsy moths uh, are from Europe and Asia and, and not uh, you know, a natural part of our environment in the Northeast. Um, yeah, so I have not heard of a problem with this. I think it could be a danger, but when um, we might have to, you know, the, know that there's a little bit of collateral damage um, to our native caterpillars in order to preserve the health of the tree, right? So it can be a food source for our native caterpillars in years uh, ahead. Right. So there was also a question is how how big is too big for spraying this? Is there like. Um, um, yeah, I would say um, we want to get the spray on before they're about three quarters of an inch long. So kind of small there. It will work, but it just takes longer. And as those insects get longer, they can feed uh, for a longer period of time after they're they come infected with this bacillus and so if they're feeding for another several days they're eating a lot of leaf area gotcha and then one more question on this um so maybe if you have trees in your yard and you were hit by gypsy moth last year and you weren't able to get anything on watching them this year and prop and spraying this year might help because you don't want your tree to go through multiple years of defoliation. Right. So is, is that something where you can like, well, I missed it last year, keep an eye on it. This year we'll be ready to go with the BT. And Absolutely. then hopefully next year you don't have it and you still have your native caterpillars. Absolutely. And uh, you, you don't, you can look at that tree and, and kind of know if it'll be an issue. Yes, yeah, some of the egg masses will be up in the canopy, but uh, they're not traveling. The, the caterpillars do not travel very far. The only thing that can travel is the adult moths when they're laying the eggs. So if you have a small tree, a crab apple say, and crab apples get gypsy moths pretty badly, um, and there's no egg masses on there, unless it's right next to another tree that has egg masses on it and the caterpillars climb up that one or because of the touching branches they get over to that tree you won't have a problem if you don't have the egg masses right because they're not moving that far it's only the adults that can fly around and lay egg masses in a new area so it shouldn't be too much of a surprise but yeah if you had it last year take a really close look because likely there are some egg masses around and let's talk about where you might uh, find it 
These are some of Gypsy Ma's favorite hosts. They feed on a lot of different things, but they really like these trees. And these are all broad leaves. I mentioned that they will also feed on blue spruce and a little bit Douglas fir. But um, alder, um, American beech, crab apple, and apple trees. So our apple growers have to watch for gypsy moths as well. Uh, aspen, perch, yeah, you, you can see the list there. So uh, quite a, a large list of their really favorite host. And then um, there's a lot that they'll feed on, but it's not their, uh, their best um, host. And then there are some that are, are really, really resistant. And those include arborvitae ash. <laughs> it's amazing that ash has something going for it with the emerald ash borer out there. But uh, these plants are, are pretty well resistant to uh, gypsy moth. Not that we'd want to plant all of these of course, the black locust is, can be invasive and black walnut has its own issues, but uh, uh, just good to know that there are some trees that do have some resistance to gypsy moth. And um, another way to control, if we're talking about management, is um, a horticultural oil that is labeled for gypsy moths. And if you're not into scraping or if they're out of reach, you could use one is uh, golden uh, pest oil, and that's a soybean based oil. Um, and you know, you follow the label, but generally it's mixed one to one with water, and then you can spray that on, and that suffocates the eggs. Um, this picture is from an extension bulletin out of Illinois, I believe. And I would rather see that person scraping off those eggs because it's not 100%. Um, you don't necessarily smother all of them with the sprays and it can be a sure thing if you scrape that off. What I do like about it is this shows that the egg messes don't always occur on the tree trunk or on a tree branch. Here it is underneath a picnic table. And uh, there is a, a trap that you can make yourself. There's some that are commercially available where you can put them on the trunk of a tree that's in your yard that uh, you may want to protect. And it is just uh, burlap. It's pretty simple. You wanna encircle the entire trunk and then have a flap. Uh, this image on the left here is showing with the flap lifted up when you're scraping these off. So you're disposing of them, smushing and disposing of the caterpillars. And it does require that during this time for two or three weeks when they're active, that they're, you're out there every day or every other day. They tend to go down at night and then climb up in the morning. And that's when they, they're not very bright. They climb up the trunk and get stuck under here. They're, they're always trying to go up, right? And uh, they run into this fold and they can't really figure it out. And so they just stay there and accumulate. Um, so that is a natural way to um, help control them. It, you know, it does take some effort to do, but you can reduce the populations in that way. There also are other insecticides that can work that can be sprayed on the foliage um, and you can check product labels and there are fact sheets out there on those and I can send those so you can have them as a reference but uh, we do get a little bit concerned because they do uh, are, are wide spectrum and can kill a lot of other insects and then we can have rebounds of other pests that come up even after the gypsy moths are gone and there's more concern about human exposure with some of those other insecticides that could be used. But uh, that's mostly what I have, but I'm happy to take questions on gypsy moths and um, hear your experiences if you've had any uh, trying to manage them or just seeing what they've done in your yard. 
Yeah, has anybody got questions? I, apparently I'm lucky because my yard is full of black walnut, catalpal, and black locusts. Ah. <laughs> so I do see them, but not in great numbers. <laughs> do you see them on those trees? I have seen them on the black walnut. Yeah. Okay. All yeah, right. But not, never a lot. And I've actually seen the ones that die of the virus. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. And actually the master gardener who brought the picture in, um, of the egg masses, she had some that appeared to be parasitized because you could see the little holes already in them where I think a parasitoid wasp goes after the eggs, Brian, oh, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, we can see some uh, some of that, yeah, different. Yeah, so I, I told her, I said, well, I guess you can, you can scrape them because if the wasp is there, it's gone and I know they don't get them all, so start scraping. Yeah, I agree. Oh no, <laughs> okay, so we have a question, Dar. Her neighbor sprayed egg masses with WD-40. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. So Janice knows this and um, maybe some uh, master gardeners know it as well. We're really not allowed to recommend anything that is not uh, a pesticide. It's not a legal use. Um, so for that to be okay, WD-40 would have to have on its label an EPA number um, that it's a registered pesticide and it hasn't been tested for that so we don't really know that that is going to be effective it might kill some of them but it's never been tested and it's it's not okay for us to recommend if somebody's calling in um, we want to steer them to um, products that are known pesticides that have exact directions on how you treat and some, some of those home remedies can be flammable and could injure yourself or harm the plant. That uh, WD-40 might penetrate into the bark and cause a little uh, dieback there. So stick to our known products. Brian, on the, on the horticultural oil, will it, are there specific ones that are specifically labeled for gypsy moth or can you use like any basic winter horticultural oil? Yeah, I think we wanna to stick to ones that have gypsy moth on the label because these egg masses have this, um, you know, the felt-like substance and that can be um, hard to penetrate. And some of the horticultural oils we apply at really low rates. This one for gypsy moth, it's one-to-one -one ratio. Some of them, have just a little bit of oil in a lot of water. And I don't okay. think that would be effective for uh, the gypsy moth eggs. All right, we did have another question about the burlap trap. Um, is another fabric okay to use if you don't have burlap? Yes, yep, you can use other fabric, absolutely. Just anything that you can fold over so that they climb up into the fold. You got it. Um, question on the BT, does it harm pets? No. It's only for caterpillars. It's only for caterpillars. It does not harm pets in, in any way. Yeah, it's uh, a specific part of the gut of a caterpillar that it affects that mammals just do not have. And even other insects aren't affected by it. Yeah, and I know BT is um, approved for organic farm use too. Yes, so. a good point. Um, other questions, folks, if you... Want to ask a question? You can unmute yourself. We're a small group. Or you can put it in the chat. Well, Brian, I don't see anything else coming in. Yeah, I'm this is Gordon. Oh, I'm okay. I'm I'm unmuting myself because if I typed it, we'd be here till one o'clock. So, <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, Gordon. Just my experience, I have um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands of the of the uh, egg masses, and I had a real problem with gypsy moths last year. Um, but uh, I've been scraping some, and I'm spraying some. Uh, with soybean oil, and uh, but the the picture that you had of all the uh, egg masses high up in trees of the oak trees that you saw someplace, yes, 
that's that's exactly how my woods looks and i and when you had a list of all the trees that they like i have every single one of those ah. and uh it's just it's just unbelievable i've i've seen bre- outbreaks before over the years and uh this is by far the worst that i've ever seen myself but uh hopefully i haven't lost anything yet so hopefully they'll only last a, a year or two but that's generally what happens, especially when they build up to the numbers that we're seeing in some areas. And what municipality are you near? Um, Batavia, just west of Batavia. West of Batavia, okay. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that it was so bad over there like it it was in Ontario County and Canandaigua area, Bristol Hills, uh, until you know Janice mentioned that but uh, yeah generally those populations build up and then they do collapse we haven't seen a sustained uh, level high level of them so hopefully this is the year i hope so i I just wanted to relay my experience that's all yeah thanks for doing that yeah okay yeah so brian with the deciduous trees mature trees can they sustain two years three years defoliation or does it yeah, depend on the year? They can, What's... you know, and there, there are factors that um, change things. So if it is a, um, you know, drought year and they're stressed, that's going to be a strike against them. Um, it depends on the amount of defoliation. In most cases, it's not complete defoliation. There's some leaves or even portions of leaves that are left that can help the tree. So those factors make a difference. Uh, but yeah, they definitely can survive even three years in most cases. And then I know conifers, if they they get a lot of damage in one year, frequently that's it for them. Yeah, you saw those pictures I had of the yeah. Douglas fir. Yeah, and it can occur on spruce trees too like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Brian. So, Master Gardener, we have our helpline desk. Last year, I know um, the DEC forester asked us for information as to where outbreaks were taking place. Does this help? You know, should we be passing that along to New York State IPM also? Was, is there anything we could record that would help New York yeah. State IPM? Yeah, for uh, Gordon, I believe, who spoke last. Yeah, getting that information uh, to the New York State DEC office can be important because if the outbreaks are bad enough, they may choose uh, to make an aerial um, BT spray if they feel it really threatens um, enough trees in an area, particularly you know a forested area. They they might um, make that application. So definitely. Um, you know, and if you're handling calls there, making a note of that, and Janice, if you're keeping an eye on it, maybe connecting with the DEC. It's not something we do in our office um, at this point for Gypsy Moth. We are, we do want to hear anything you know about Spotted Lanternfly, but right. Right, Gypsy Moth, the DEC is the place. They, they have foresters in each of the region, so. Yeah, we've got a good connection with our, our region forester, so. That's a good question, and yeah, glad to glad you brought that up. Yep. Glad you have that connection with your regional forester. Yep. Okay. Anybody else have a question for Brian? Now's a good time to to pick pick his brain. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody else have an infestation that we don't know about? Eileen, I, um, we are recording this, so yes, you'll be able to use this for your Orleans County Master Gardener program. I'll send everybody who registered the link when I get it up onto our YouTube page. All right, I think yeah. I'm going to stop recording, and I want to thank uh, Brian.